Good day. This lecture uh, is drawn from chapter 2, pages 50 to 63 of the source book in Indian philosophy, which is this book that you have in front of you. Um, I will no longer go to the pages uh, that uh, to the pages, but uh, I hope uh, you'll take initiative to actually look into the text and read the text, especially pages fifty to sixty-seven. You know, uh, as we have said, uh, fifty to sixty-three. I uh. I added four more pages for you. Uh, but that will be still about the Upanishads and uh, and more specifically to the Upanishad uh, that we will look at right now, uh, Prasna. No? Prasna. Uh, and here, uh, the questioning begins no? um, about, and we will see that, in the slides that will follow uh, these sections uh, will play a very important role. Allow me to share my slides, uh, which uh, were adapted, borrowed from a course in Indian philosophy. So today we will look at the Kena and Katha Upanishads. Please take note that there are many types of Upanishads and we are specifically looking at these sections of the Upanishads. The Kena Upanishads. Uh, Kena, uh, as you would look at it, is a word which means by whom. No, It's like inquiring who said it and the like. By asking Kena, we're asking by whom. So the Upanishad is an inquiry into the nature of perception and a clarification as to how we perceive things. No? So it concludes by indicating that the by indicating that it is the Atman, which is, as we've said, very much related to the Brahman. Um, that is the real power behind the workings of the universe, both internal and external. So going back, uh, let's look at the first verse of the Kina Upanishads. By whom does the mind go forward toward its object? Being directed by whom does the life force, prana, proceed to its function? That's the very interesting question there. By whom impelled do the people utter their speech? So it's really a question of where it's directed, to whom it's directed. It begs the question further. What luminous force directs the eyes and the ears? So when you look at these very specific questions from the Kina Upanishads, you realize that the first verse is really an inquiry into direction, an inquiry into force, an inquiry into impelling, luminous force, and the like. The second verse, it's more interesting. It says, it is the ear of the ear, the mind of the mind, the speech of the speech, the life of life, the eye of the eye. That answer is very interesting. It's like talking about the very ear of the ear, the very mind of the mind, the very speech of the speech, the very life of life, the very eye of the eye. So the wise who separates the Atman 
from the sensory functions become immortal recognizes immortality even. The third and fourth verses, let's look at it. The eye cannot approach it, neither speech nor mind. We do not therefore know it, nor do we know how to teach it. It is different from what is known, and it is beyond what is known, unknown. Thus, we have heard from our teachers who taught us. That's a, what is it that the eye cannot approach? What is it that cannot be spoken about? What is that which cannot be thought? And therefore, what is that which we cannot know? And as such, cannot be taught. The Upanishad speaks of something different. Something that is unknowable. Something that is different from what can be known. But is also beyond the unknowable. And therefore, there's not just dichotomy that exists here between what can be known and unknown, but even that which goes beyond the knowable. Thus, we have heard from our teachers who taught us. So what speech cannot reveal, but what reveals speech? That is obviously Brahman. And when we speak of Brahman here, this is not what people can conceptualize. This is not what people can worship what mind does not comprehend but what comprehends mind that is the brahman what sight cannot see but what sees sight that is brahman and not what people worship here what hearing cannot hear but what hears hearing that is brahman not what people worship here. What the sense of smell cannot reveal, but what reveals the sense of smell, that is Brahman, not what people worship here. So when you look at these verses from the Upanishads, it tells you that it's not the other way around. It's not the speech that reveals, but that which reveals speech. It's not the mind that comprehends, the, but what the what comprehends mind. It's not what the sight can see, but what sees sight. What hearing cannot hear, but that which hears hearing. And what smell cannot reveal, but what reveals smells. The, the play about what this Brahman is, uh, is something that we need to take into consideration if we are to understand the relationship between Brahman and Atman. Uh, if we look at the physiology of perception, we see how the nervous system gathers information and sends it to the brain via electrical impulses. Uh, the nervous system is composed of nerve cells and these nerve cells are called neurons if you're familiar with how a neuron look like this is how a neuron look like from the nuclei uh, that has dendrites no the electric current will pass through myelin sheets the node of radiator through the axons and they and it will end up with the synapses and the synapses are actually where the dendrites are connected. And that's why we say new synapses at times also. Uh, so each neuron has three parts. The cell body containing the nucleus, the dendrites, which brings incoming electrical signals. The axons, which emit outgoing electrical signals. A neuron is connected to thousands of other neurons and as I've said also a while ago, the point of contact is a synapse no? or synapses. Um, this is how it looks like in the microscope. So 
neurons eventually. So there are more than 100 billion neurons in the brain. And even though the brain is only 2% of the mass of the body, it draws more than 25% of the body's blood supply. That's how powerful the brain is. The electrical signals sent out of the brain travel at speeds greater than 200 miles an hour. If you have time, you can search also about how neurons transfer information and you'd be amazed also about how that is done. So how are perceptions unified? So there are still many more mysteries in neurology that have yet to be solved. Uh, that scientists are not yet able to fully explicate or even clarify how we perceive. To return to the Kina Upanishad, the teacher warns the student as follows. If you think that you know Brahman well, then you know little indeed. For the form of Brahman that you see in the living beings and luminous forces is but a trifle. You should inquire further into the nature of Brahman. The student replies, I think I know Brahman, to which the teacher says, maybe not. No? And here you see the spirit of inquiry. When we say we know something, we put an end to our knowledge of it. We don't inquire further. Our attitude determines to a large extent the amount of knowledge we gain. In the next verse, the student says, I do not think I know it well, nor do I think that I know not I that I not I do not know it. He knows it, who knows that it is other than the unknown and the known. So the teacher, he knows who knows it not, no? Uh, and then that's really his reply. You know? He knows who knows it not. So that if you think you know, if you think you understood, if you think you know uh, what the Brahman is, the teacher reminds us, in reality, maybe you don't. Uh, he knows it not who knows. He knows it not who knows. So, it's a matter of really clarifying when you say you know it, do you really know it or maybe not? Uh, it is unknown to the one who knows. So that the very fact that you claim to know it is the very fact that you don't know it. Okay? Uh, It is known to the one who does not know that the person who does not aim at knowing, possessing, holding is actually the one who knows it, who understands it, who clarifies it. You know? um, and that is interesting in and of itself. Um, let's look at again the teacher's reply. He knows who knows it not. He knows who knows it not. He knows it not who knows. It is unknown to the one who knows. It is known to the one who does not know. Everything around is infinite. We cannot know everything even about a particle of sand. William Blake writes, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Beautiful poem, in fact. But how in everything there is a detail that cannot be comprehended fully. A grain of sand, the petal of a flower, everything seems to be infinite. Everything 
seems to be unfathomable. And here we see the open secret. No? Vivekananda writes, Whichever way we turn in trying to understand things in the reality, if we analyze far enough, we find that at last we come to a peculiar state of things, seemingly a contradiction, something which our reason cannot grasp, and yet is a fact. We take up something, we know it is finite, but as soon as we begin to analyze it, it leads us beyond our reason, and we never find an end to all its qualities to all its possibilities, its powers, its relations, it has become infinite. Infinite. Further, Vivekananda explains, everything in this life is so vast that the intellect is nothing in comparison with it. We ourselves this is the greatest mystery of the universe, we ourselves. He who thinks he knows Brahman has a conception in his mind, a concept, an understanding. Since no conception can capture all of Brahman, the individual cannot really say he knows it because no concept can pin it down. No concept can make it come forth, make it intelligible. The Upanishad continues by giving a means to realize Brahman. He who is aware of it through every pulsation of knowing, gains immortality. There. How do you realize Brahman? Appreciate Brahman? By being aware of Brahman, through every pulsation of knowing. The Atman, therefore, is the source of strength and vigor, and through its awareness, we gain immortality. We gain access to immortality. For one who has realized it here and now, there is true life. To realize immortality now, for one who has not, so much is the loss. If we recognize, for example, that there is immortality in things, in everything, that is immortality. Discovering the Atman, therefore, in every being, Recognizing the Atman in everything, the wise becomes immortal. What is the meaning of immortality here? Immortality means the transcendence of life and death. Immortality means the transcendence of change. Going beyond life and death. Going beyond change. By realizing the Atman, we enter the dimensions of the unchanging, the eternal, and thus become immortal. Let's look at the story uh, here. So Brahman obtained victory for the Devas, the luminous energies. Though the victory was due to Brahman, the devas became elated by it and thought, this victory is ours, the glory is ours. Brahman came to know of their vanity and appeared before them. 
but they did not understand what appeared before them. The devas asked Agni to investigate, and Agni hastened to that. It asked, Who are you? I am fire, Agni replied. I can burn anything. Then that being asked, Can you burn this blade of grass? Agni roused up its enthusiasm and energy, but could not burn the blade of grass. He returned to the devas and told them he could not fathom that. Let's pause a bit uh, with this story. So, look at the exchange very closely how the devas considered Brahman's victory as theirs and how Brahman appeared to them and inquired who they are and how we reply that we are fire capable of burning anything but incapable of doing so and that in our incapability of doing so we simply declared that Brahman cannot be understood. Reflect about it. In Indian philosophy, uh, it's also very important to pause a bit and consider uh, the reality being pushed forward. Something to pay attention to. So the devas ask Vayu to go and determine what that is. Vayu went on being asked, who are you? Vayu replied, I am Matarizvan, the life force. I can blow anything. That being then said, Brahman said, can you blow away this blade of grass? By roused up its full force to blow away the blade of grass, but could not do so. He returned to the devas and told them he could not fathom Brahman. Finally, Indra went, and as he approached it, Brahman disappeared. In that spot appeared the luminous female form, Uma, daughter of the snow-clad mountains. Indra asked her, Who was that? She replied, That was Brahman. It was through the power of Brahman that you achieved your glory. Through the words of Uma, Indra understood that was Brahman. Agni, Vayu, and Indra exhale the devas since they approached Brahman. Indra excels others since he was the first to know that was Brahman. What is Uma? What is Uma? Remember, it was Uma in this story. Uh, that actually told Indra that was Brahman. So what is Uma? Neither Agni, Vayu, or Indra were able to understand it. Indra does not see that, but rather sees Uma. No? Not Brahman, but Uma. Recall that Indra is the power that controls the sense organs or the power of the mind. Uma is the combined wisdom of the sages here, symbolically represented as the snow-clad mountains, the meditative retreat of the philosophers of the age. The teacher continues, 
This is the teaching regarding that, or Brahman. It is like a flash of lightning or the wink of an eye. This is with reference to Brahman's aspect as cosmic manifestation. The knowledge of Brahman can be gained through a study of external nature, but the perception of Brahman is momentary, like a flash of lightning or the wink of an eye. It is like a opportunity given so that others can see, so that others can recognize. So how to make the experience of Brahman last longer than a lightning or a wink of eye? The manifestation of that in the human being can be perceived inwardly by the mind. Brahman can be remembered and imagined as being nearer than the near in every particle of time. Brahman is called the adorable one. It can be meditated upon that way as the adorable one. By being constantly aware of the workings of the mind, Indra, the life principle, Vayu, and the fire principle, Agni, we can actually approach Brahman. Sir, please teach me the Upanishad. The teacher replies, I have just taught you the Upanishad. I just imparted to you the knowledge of Brahman. The student has not understood and asked the teacher to explain it again. The patient teacher continues, Of the Upanishad, Tapas, concentration of energies of the mind and senses, Dhamma, self-restraint, and Karma, dedicated work, form the foundation. The Vedas are its limbs. Truth is its abode. One who realizes Brahman is liberated from ignorance and becomes established in Brahman. These texts are very difficult to explain, as you'd see by now. Uh, and yet, also, at the same time, they're very revelatory. Uh, demonstrating to us the Upanishads at work. And so the teacher says, yes, the student becomes established in Brahman. Only if you do tapas, dhamma, and karma. That's the first part of the Upanishads that we're looking at today, the Kina Upanishad. We will now move to the Katha Upanishads. And here we are. The Katha Upanishad is a dialogue between a young boy named Nachiketas and Yama, the god of death. In the 19th century, Edwin Arnold gave a freestyle translation of it and published it as The Secret of Death. Somerset Mogham was inspired after reading it that he titled one of his novels the razor's edge, which is a phrase lifted right out of the Upanishad. I invite you to look at that book by Somerset. Uh, as people say, it's of interesting content. Let's look at the three boons. No, three boons. 
His father should have peace of mind. What is heaven? Is there such a place? When a person dies, what happens to him? On the second question, Vive Vivekananda writes, The idea of heaven is found in many cultures. Living in heaven would not be very different from life in this world. At best, it would only a very healthy rich person's life with plenty of sense enjoyments and a sound body which knows no disease. The vast part of phenomena which we actually see is not matter. For instance, what a great part is played by thought and feeling. How vast is this internal world? The heaven solution commits this mistake. It insists that the whole of phenomena is only in touch, taste, and etc. Nasiketas asks, I want to understand the mystery of death. Yama replies, Even the gods has doubt on this point. And it is hard to understand. Very subtle is the matter. Choose some other boon. Nasiketas does not relent. Yama then says, Choose long life, wealth and health on this planet, heavenly maidens, and many more pleasures. I will make you the lord of the earth. But please, do not ask this question. Nasit Ketas still does not relent. These things you offer are ephemeral. They are passing. They are temporary. The powers of the body wear away. Keep your damsels, song and dance. Reveal to me the mystery of death. In this verse, we see what tremendous determination is needed for one who wants to probe further. They convey to us the mental and the emotional attitude we need to approach higher knowledge. It is along that line that we see Sierras and Preyas. Yama says, the better, Sreyas, is one thing, and the pleasant, Preyas, quite another. Of these two, the wise choose the better rather than the pleasant, and the fool chooses the pleasant. Maybe it's good to pause a bit and ask ourselves, what do we choose? Do we choose the better or do we choose the pleasant? Because accordingly, Yama would say, if you're intelligent, wise, even, you'll choose the better. Even if it's not pleasant. But if you're a fool, you choose the pleasant and not the better. It reminds me more like our cheap dopamine instances when we aim at cheap pleasures. What are examples of cheap pleasures? Mm, alcohol, pornography, cell phones, and the like. Even to hear of the Atman is not available to many. Those having heard of it cannot comprehend it. Wonderful is Atman's teacher and equally wonderful must its pupil be. So what is Atman? So Atman is, it is subtler, subtler than the subtlest, that was difficult to pronounce, and beyond logic and reason. It cannot be reached by vain argumentation. It cannot be understood by discourse. The wise 
relinquish both joy and sorrow, and develop meditation on the Atman, the ancient effulgent one. Hard to see, very profound even, hidden in experience, seated in the heart, and animating this body. The goal of which the Vedas speak, the goal for which sages practice austerities, that goal is Om. This syllable represents Brahman. It is the highest syllable. By meditating upon it, one gets nearer to it. Om. Rangana Sananda explains A word and its meaning are inseparable. History has shown that human knowledge in various fields has been greatly advanced by the invention and use of symbols. Language itself is a collection of symbols. Quantities and numbers become simplified when expressed through symbols. When ancient Indian scientific thought invented the numerals, including the zero sign, the algebraic symbols and the decimal systems, it helped immensely to simplify mathematics and its handling of immense quantities. When the Indian sages realized the absolute and the unconditioned in the unity of the Brahman and the Atman, they felt the need for an adequate symbol to communicate such an incommunicable truth. It's quite difficult to still try to make sense of Atman and Brahman and the relationship between the two. And yet, also at the same time, we cannot say we have understood it. For the very moment we say we understood it is the very moment we have not understood it. There is such an unknowing in the knowing here. That's why in their search, Rangana, Rangana Thananda explains, in their search, they came across the sound symbol Om. They analyzed this sound Om and discovered that of all sounds, Om possessed universality. Om possessed universality. So let's continue looking at the nature of the Atman. Yama continues, The Atman is not born, nor does it die. It has not come from anything, nor has anything come from it. It is unborn, eternal, everlasting, and ancient. It is not slain when the body is slain. If the slayer thinks that he slays and the slain thinks himself slain, neither of these understand that the Atman does not slay nor is it slain. That the death of the body cannot at all refer to the death of Atman. These are two different realities and as such must be understood as such. Let's look at Emerson and Brahma. The 19th century philosopher and writer Ralph Waldo Emerson was inspired by these verses of the Katha Upanishad when he wrote his famous poem on Brahma. He writes, 
If the red slayer thinks he slays, or if the slain thinks he is slain, they know not well the subtle ways. I keep and pass and turn again. Let's go back to the previous slide. The Atman is not born, nor does it die. It has not come from anything, nor has anything come from it. It, it wasn't generated, and therefore doesn't have an end. It is unborn, eternal, everlasting, and ancient. It's not slain when the body is slain. If the slayer thinks that he slays, and the slain thinks himself slain, neither of these understand. That the Atman does not slay nor is slain. That's why the red slayer thinks he slays, or if the slain thinks he's slain, they know not well the subtle ways. I keep and pass and turn again. More on the Atman. It is smaller than the smallest, greater than the greatest, and is ever present in the heart of all creatures. One who is free from selfish desires realizes the Atman through a serene mind and thus becomes free from sorrow. Realizing the Atman as bodiless, in the embodied changelessness, in the changing, infinite, and all-pervading, the wise one does not grieve. It is not known through study nor by the intellect. It is not known through hearing. What can be said about this? No? Here we see the imagery of the chariot. The Atman is the master of the chariot. The body is the chariot. Know, know the intellect. Buddhi is the charioteer and the mind. Manas as the reins. The sense organs are the horses, and the sense objects are the roads they travel over. So Atman is the master of the chariot. The body is the chariot. The intellect is the charioteer. So the body is the charioteer. The mind are, are the reins. The sense organs are the horses. The sense objects are the roads. Very, very interesting. For him who is devoid of understanding, with the mind not disciplined, the sense organs become uncontrolled, like the unruly horses of the chariot. He does not reach the goal, but returns to the world of birth and death again. But he who has proper understanding, mind under control, ever pure, reaches the goal. So let's look at the hierarchy of actions there. No? Uh, so, higher than the senses are the sense objects. Higher than the sense objects is the mind. Reason or buddhi is higher than the mind. The mahat or awareness is higher than buddhi. Higher than mahat is avyakta, undifferentiated nature. The infinite self, Purusa, is greater than Avyakta. And Purusa is the supreme goal. There is nothing higher 
than purusa. Please pronounce it as purusa because if you call it parusa uh, in the Philippines, that would mean punishment no? <laughs> than the highest goal. Tam tan matras. How can sense object be higher than the senses? The term does not refer to objects visible to the eye, but to their nuclear dimension. The Tanmatra, as the Vedanta philosophy, to be studied later, explains it. And we will see it as we move forward. We don't perceive sense objects. We perceive their reconstruction in the mind. That is a very strong claim, of course. But it's not, well, that's not totally new because, for example, Immanuel Kant will actually argue that the categories of the mind actually allows us to sense a lot of things. But of course, Kant is how many centuries uh, away from these thoughts. They were really ahead of their time. The razor's edge. The Atman is hidden in all beings and is not manifest to all. But it can be realized by refined reason and inquiry. The seeker of knowledge should merge speech in the mind, the mind in the buddhi, the buddhi in the mahat, the mahat in the Atman, the abode of peace. Arise, awake, and enlighten yourself by approaching the great teachers. The sages say the path is difficult to walk upon, as sharp as the razor's edge. By realizing Brahman or Atman, which is beyond sound, beyond touch, beyond form, imperishable, beyond taste, eternal, one is liberated from the jaws of death. That's the razor's edge. Razor's edge. That's what we can learn from the Atman. How? Uh, the seeker of knowledge should merge speech in his in the mind, the mind in the buddhi, the buddhi in the mahat, the mahat in the Atman. The sages say the path is difficult to walk upon, as sharp as the razor's edge there. But by realizing that which is beyond sound, beyond touch, beyond form, imperishable, beyond taste, eternal, one is liberated from the jaws of death. The outward projection. So the sensory organs look outward and thus there is a tendency to look outward and not within. A certain sage desiring immortality turned his mind and senses inward and realized the Atman. The childish go after external pleasures and fall into the snare of death. But the wise seeking immortality, do not crave for things in this changing world. Amazing. The childish go after external pleasures and fall into the snares of death. But the wise do not crave for things in the changing world. 